Good afternoon. Welcome back to UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Welcome to our live audience uh, from our department, from throughout uh, UCSF and our health network. Uh, as usual, we'll post this video to YouTube tonight at about 7.30, and I will tweet the web address and a summary of the session. Our previous Grand Rounds have now uh, received over 1 million views on YouTube. A few quick ground rules for the live audience are shown here. Uh, you'll be on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box. My colleague, Quinny Chang, is monitoring them and will pitch to me uh, some, of, some of the questions. We'll get to as many as we can. A couple of quick program notes uh, before we start. First, starting next week, uh, there, is, uh, there is healthcare and medicine outside of COVID. So we're going to be going to an every other week COVID grand round. So next week, uh, we're doing a session on, uh, on an update on allergy and then back to another COVID grand rounds on October 8th. Second program note you see here, uh, my ID colleagues and I will be hosting uh, this one day advances in COVID-19, an update for clinicians uh, on uh, November 6th. It, it, I think it'll be fantastic. And if you're interested, uh, you can see the uh, more information at our CME site. The address is listed there. Okay, let's go back to, uh, to me. Uh, and uh, on to today's program. So uh, two days ago, we hit a, a grim milestone in the United States, 200,000 deaths from COVID-19. That's such a large number and hard to get your arms around. So let me give you a few comparisons. Uh, 200,000 is the entire population of Salt Lake City. 200,000 is a completely filled University of Michigan football stadium twice over. And perhaps most vividly, uh, 200,000 is 67 September 11th. Living and working in San Francisco, we've certainly been affected by COVID in profound ways in terms of its clinical toll. We've also seen troubling evidence of healthcare disparities in both cases and outcomes. And the impact on our economy, on our social interactions, and our mental health has been intense. That said, of the 20 most populous cities in the United States, San Francisco has had the second lowest case rate, just behind Seattle, by far the lowest mortality rate per case, and by far the lowest death rate per population. As of today, in the city of San Francisco, we've seen 99 deaths from COVID. By contrast, tragically, Los Angeles has seen nearly 6,500. New York has seen nearly 25,000. They are both about 10 times bigger than San Francisco. In fact, if the entire country had had San Francisco's per capita death rate, we would have had 36,000 deaths rather than 200,000. In other words, 160,000 people would still be alive. In today's Grand Rounds, we will explore San Francisco's remarkable response to COVID, the many things that went right and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. I'm thrilled and honored that we have the three most responsible officials from our great city joining us today, Mayor London Breed, Health Director Grant Colfax, and Thomas Aragon, the city's health officer. Later in the program, they'll be joined by our own faculty, Diane Havler, George Rutherford, and Paul Volberding. I'll introduce all of them uh, later, and we'll talk more about the UCSF response and really the unique synergy of, uh, of UCSF and the city. But let's start with uh, Chancellor Sam Hawgood, who will introduce the mayor to all of you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, today to welcome San Francisco Mayor London Breed to today's UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds focused on COVID-19. Mayor Breed, you last visited our Mission Bay campus in early 2019, uh, of course, well before the pandemic, when you participated in our Leadership Speakers Series. And so I'm very pleased to welcome you back to UCSF today. In 2018, London Breed, a native San Franciscan, was the first African-American woman elected to serve as mayor of the city and county of San Francisco. Prior to becoming mayor, she served as president of the Board of Supervisors, where her district included both the UCSF Parnassus Heights campus as well as our Mount Zion campus. Mayor Breed was raised by her grandmother in the Plaza East public housing in the Western Edition neighborhood. She graduated with honors from the Galileo High School in San Francisco, and then she earned a bachelor's degree in political science and public service at UC Davis. Following that, she obtained her master's degree in public administration from USF. Now, during her last visit to UCSF, 
Mayor Breed shared with me that she first tried her hand as a chemistry major. Uh, so we know that she has a particular appreciation for the work done at UCSF. San Francisco is indeed fortunate to have a mayor who believes what science tells us during this pandemic period. And we're very fortunate to have a mayor who strongly believes in the role of public health in keeping us all safe. In March, under Mayor Breed's leadership, San Francisco became the first region in the country to issue a shelter in place order. There is no question in my mind that that action, that courageous action, kept our infection rate lower than the rest of the country and without doubt saved the lives of many San Franciscans. From the beginning of the pandemic, we have been very grateful for Mayor Breed's leadership. UCSF continues to work as part and parcel of the coordinated public health response to COVID-19. I believe we have the strongest Department of Public Health and the strongest leadership of any major city in the US. You'll hear more about this and the partnership with UCSF later in the program. Now, as I look to the future, I look forward to continue to work with the mayor and her city leadership on our comprehensive Parnassus Heights plan, which will transform our aging campus with a brand new state-of-the-art hospital. And the pandemic has showed how desperate uh, we are for that kind of a facility in San Francisco. New research labs and classroom space. This plan will increase our opportunity to serve not only the citizens of San Francisco, but the citizens of California. So in collaboration with the mayor, the board of supervisors and her city departments, we are planning additional community investments in transit, housing and open space that will benefit both the UCSF community as well as our neighbors for decades to come. So Mayor Breed, thank you for your leadership of our city and your partnership with the university. It's my great pleasure to welcome you back to UCSF. Good afternoon, everyone. It is really great to be here with all of you. Thank you to Chancellor Sam Hoggood and to Diane Havlier, Dr. George Rutherford, and to the UCSF faculty, staff, and students. We could not have ever imagined that this year we would be facing one of the biggest public health crises of our lifetimes. But we have also seen how our phenomenal medical professionals have risen to the occasion. We have seen the direct impact of UCSF as a leading research institution and partner in fighting back this disease. UCSF has been our partner in providing testing to vulnerable populations who have been hit especially hard by COVID. We've been able to set up sites in the Mission, the Bayview, Visitation Valley, and with the partnership of UCSF, the 24th Street BART Station. And UCSF has stepped up to increase bed capacity at Mount Zion Hospital and created a new COVID-19 unit at St. Francis. It is because of the work of UCSF, our incredible hospital system, and our public health department that we can report San Francisco is currently doing better than the rest of the Bay Area when it comes to managing COVID. Thanks to your efforts and to the efforts of all San Franciscans to do their part, we have the lowest COVID-19 related mortality rate of any other major US city, which was said earlier today. San Franciscans have done their part with masking up, socially distancing, getting tested if they feel sick or think they might have been exposed, and yes, washing their hands. Since declaring an emergency in February, we have conducted over 480,000 tests. Our rate of hospitalizations is decreasing and our average positivity rate is about 2%. We're currently reaching at about 79% of the people who test positive for COVID and are reaching 84% of the people that they have been in contact, contact with through our contact tracing program. But as all of you know, we are not out of the woods yet. 
COVID-19 is going to be with us for a long time. We must still be vigilant because we know that these trends could change overnight if people don't continue to follow the public health recommendations. We've been conducting outreach to make sure that we educate the importance of wearing face mask and, and doing our part to follow the public health orders. Earlier this month, we launched a citywide multicultural and multilingual mask campaign to remind folks to protect themselves and to protect others by masking up. This virus has shown us that it targets disparities in our society. It preys on people who have poor health due to historical inequities in our healthcare system. It preys on people who live in crowded conditions due to income inequality, which makes it hard to maintain social distance. It preys on people who, because of their immigration status and ongoing attacks against our immigrant communities, are weary of speaking to government officials, including our public health officials. Our outer neighbors and our communities of color, particularly the Latino community, has been the hardest hit. This is why we have targeted outreach and education efforts and are opening test testing sites in neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. I directed over $300,000 to support the opening of the Latino Task Force Resource Hub to make sure that we are responding to the community. And we'll have some major announcements today, which I'm really excited about that will help deal with the disparity that we know still exists in the Latino community. To make sure there is adequate testing and that people have culturally competent services to help them with their needs, such as getting income relief and applying for housing and accessing Medicare. You think that those things would be simple, but it definitely has been challenging. COVID-19 has made it clear how critical housing is for a healthy city, especially among people facing homelessness. In response to the pandemic, we've opened more than 20 hotel sites with over 2,600 rooms for unsheltered people who are vulnerable to COVID to isolate and shelter indoors. This undertaking is at a scale that is really unprecedented in the city's history. But these hotels are a temporary solution for what we know is a long-term need. We have continued our long-term planning to provide housing solutions for people experiencing homelessness in San Francisco and created our homeless recovery plan. This week, I was proud to announce that we will be using funding from the state's Project Home Key to purchase the Granada Hotel and open 232 units of permanent supportive housing for our most vulnerable residents. We are also making citywide investments where it counts so that we can get through this and slow the spread of the virus. And this is why in my proposed budget, we have $450 million for COVID-19 resources, including of course, continued testing, food security programs, temporary housing, and continued outreach and education. But one of the most important investments we will make is in our children. We know that this has been really challenging and has really cost you know, our kids so much. We're seeing a significant increase in the achievement gap for kids who are already struggling, struggling before uh, this pandemic. Keeping them safe meant temporarily closing schools. And we know how important it is for kids and especially their parents to make sure they don't fall behind, especially, as I said, in low income communities. Our schools also keep our children healthy. They provide three nutritious meals a day for children who may not know where their next meal is coming from. I want to send children back to school, but we must do so only when we can safely do so. This is why we created our community hubs at more than 40 sites to support distance learning for thousands of high need students. It's been a team effort with many city departments and community organizations working to get these sites up and running. At the same time, the San Francisco Unified School District is working towards a learning model that is both in-person and online. We are requiring that schools have an approved health and safety plan before opening. And we are possibly the only country in the United States that, uh, to do this. We're, we have also committed $15 million in new funding to the San Francisco Unified School District so that when our public schools do reopen, 
they are able to support our students and maintain staff and uh, teachers. There is a lot we still need to do that we don't, there's still a lot that we don't know about this virus and what the road looks like ahead. But we do know that eventually we will recover. It's gonna take us all doing our part and working together if we're gonna successfully fight back against this virus. I'm really glad that UCSF has been a partner and I look forward to continuing our working relationship uh, to support the community with more testing and access to our healthcare systems. This is how we are gonna emerge from this crisis stronger and more resilient than ever before. And even though it feels like it's endless and we're never gonna to get to that point, one day we're gonna wake up and we're gonna look back and we're gonna really appreciate all that we've experienced so much more because of what we're going through right now. I'm confident San Franciscans that we'll get through this and we'll emerge stronger than ever. Thank you so much. And I'll open it up to the question and answer session. Thank you, Mayor Bree. That was uh, inspiring. And, and thank you for all you've done for all of us, for the university and most importantly, for the people of San Francisco. Uh, let me introduce a couple of your colleagues uh, to join us. Now, the mayor has to leave at 1230. So most of the Q&A as we start will be directed toward her. Uh, but I want to introduce Grant Colfax and Thomas Aragon. Let me start with Grant, who is the Director of Public Health for the City and County of San Francisco. Prior to this role, he served as Director of the Office of National AIDS Policy in the Obama administration. Probably most importantly, he was my resident when I was an attending at the county uh, a few years ago, and I, I would have treated him uh, more nicely if I knew he was going to send to this position. Uh, in his role, he is in charge of the San Francisco General, Zuckerberg San Francisco General, Laguna Honda, 14 primary care clinics, behavioral health, population health. Uh, it's a huge portfolio. So Grant, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, another UCSF product, uh, all part of the family, is Thomas Aragon, uh, who's the health officer of the city and county and directs the population health division in the Department of Public Health. Hello, Thomas. He's also assistant adjunct professor of epidemiology at the School of Public Health at Berkeley. Uh, Thomas's career focus has been to mobilize communities to improve health and equity across all populations. And I can vouch for that because he was already uh, focused on that as a resident. Uh, it's, it's great to see all both of you have accomplished and, uh, and, and we're uh, uh, proud of you as UCSF products and, uh, and thank you for all you've done uh, during this terrible time. Uh, let me start off with uh, Mayor Breed. Tell us about the moment you had a sense, the, you first had a sense of how big and bad this thing was going to be, and, and, and how did you process that? I, there must have been an inclination to say, maybe it's not gonna be that bad, and, and you acted before any other mayor did in the country, so what led to that? Well, I think it had a lot to do with uh, the two gentlemen that you uh, have just joined us, Dr. Aragon and Dr. Colfax. Uh, I remember that Dr. Colfax consistently, uh, ever since December, uh, probably November, I think the end of November, uh, we started to have conversations about what was happening uh, in Wuhan and the possible impacts uh, and the uncertainty. And you know, initially you're thinking, okay, well, it's way over there. It'll never reach San Francisco. And not to mention San Francisco, like we can handle anything, right? <laughs> um, I think it got pretty intense for me when the day when uh, Dr. Colfax and a few other uh, folks uh, came into my office, they actually like had to meet with me physically <laughs> to talk to me about, okay, here is what's going on. And, and, and I think what really shocked me into a place where we needed to be aggressive, um, we were making certain decisions um, about operating the emergency center and other things. But the, the bigger issue came when they said, based on you know, the fact that we have UCSF in San Francisco, right? That one of the most premier research institutions and places uh, of medicine in the world. And we have CPMC, we have Kaiser, we have all these hospitals all over San Francisco, general and um, these clinics and everything else. With a surge, we could not handle it. And people will be turned away at the door and people will die at alarming rates. And there's still uncertainty about the disease at that time. That was what stopped me in my tracks. And we got to a point where I know you remember at first we were limiting the number of large gatherings and it got to the point where I said to Dr. Colfax, I'm not limiting another thing. We need to shut San Francisco down. We are at that point 
because my, my biggest concern was, you know, if people are still moving around and still touching each other and we don't know a lot. And if we have a surge and we can't handle it, people are going to die. And so that was really my push uh, um, because these two doctors were the ones in the midst of the, the data and understanding and the conversation and providing me with information. And, and that's really, you know, why I felt strongly about doing it and felt comfortable doing it. Uh, I think that people were starting to get ready because we declared a state of emergency. We started to limit the number of events. And so that all kind of put people on pause. But when we finally said it's time to set San Francisco down, it, 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 people were like, oh, OK. I mean, like and they complied and, and they adjusted. But I think they did so because they didn't think it would be so long. Right. So. right. Well, I, I guess I, I'd love to follow up with that. As wonderful as, as Grant and Tomas are, I'm imagining there were health officials in other cities that had the same conversation with their mayors. And the mayors said, eh, you're overreacting or the political stakes here are too high. I can't shut the I can't shut everything down. Is there anything about your background or you know, sort of how you approach problems that that sort of explains why you were able to be that aggressive? Is there not everybody did it and they probably all had similar information. I think that, you know, one of the things when I decided to be an elected office, I had to accept the fact that everyone is not going to agree with me. Everyone is not going to like me. They're not going to like some of the decisions that I make. But at the end of the day, I have a responsibility to the people of this city to not necessarily do always what I may want to do, but to do what is right for the people. And what I also think about is, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm honored and, and blessed and even surprised that I am mayor because it's not as if I sat down, you know, I sat on a path from public housing to, I never expected to be mayor. Um, but all I can think about is what would I want my mayor to do? Hmm. How would I want to feel if I were a citizen of this city and there's something coming and I didn't completely understand it? And, and, and for me, that's why we kept doing, even when we didn't know what to say or how to communicate, I was like, we gotta do a press conference. We gotta let the people know, like, we can't wait. We gotta communicate. And, and, and it was hard because I knew with the hotels and tourism and everything and the events and the birthday parties and the weddings. And, you know, I was thinking about those people. I really was. And it was heartbreaking because of the brides and the people who, who wanted, who had plans um, and the kids and the schools. And so, so it was hard, but, but what made me think about like in my mind, because I grew up in a community where there were a lot, there was a lot of violence. A lot of my friends, I lost to gun violence. And all I can think about is what if we would have done something different? How would that person who pulled the trigger or how would that person who you know ended up dead? How could we have prevent that from happening in the first place? Mm -hmm. So I think my background from that perspective, and what was happening, and the uncertainty, and 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 my concern about the life of the people of San Francisco, especially you know seniors and people with underlying health conditions, I felt like I had no choice, and I knew that it was going to be hard. And I don't think it's fair to the people of this city to do this job in fear of losing it and, and, and do it as if it's some popularity contest. You are here to make the hard decisions. And so as hard as it was, it was hard, yeah. but it was necessary. And we are seeing the results of taking that, um, that early action. Can you, thank you. I, I, that's, that sounds, uh, it's, 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 it's extraordinarily brave because it certainly could have gone other ways, but uh, but you know your commitment to doing the right thing is is obvious. Uh, talk a little bit about the both the people of San Francisco because there are places that 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 where the leadership did the right thing, but the people didn't. So talk about is there something in, in, about the city of San Francisco that it has people inclined to listen to people like you and and Granta Tomas or inclined to believe the science? Well, I think um, for the most part, uh, you had people who were complying and then you had others who may not have felt comfortable or completely understood, right? Because again, this there was so much uncertainty. Um, and I know Dr. Aragon was working with other um, of the, some of the other county health officers to develop a coordinated response so that we were all on the same page. Um, and 
you know, in many cases, um, you know, there were different desires for different counties, but ultimately we all had the same desire. Of course, that was to protect public health. And that meant a lot of conversations that meant not just communicating to people from a perspective of a doctor mm -hmm. and, and, and talking in the kinds of terms that you all talk in, <laughs> but how do you communicate to people from a perspective of how they get it as it relates to their own personal situation? And so it took us some time. I mean, we're still struggling with, um, you know, folks who are not always wearing their mask or following the health orders. And so coming up with a creative solution, we had some kids make a video, we've been doing posters, we've been doing campaigns and, and just also trying to do outreach and education to communities that traditionally feel like they're left out. So from day one, when we operated our emergency operations center, we embedded an equity team so the equity team was to make sure that they stayed connected. So for example, there were places where people uh, had nail salons and they didn't speak English and they didn't close and they didn't understand that they were too close. And so we have folks who, who spoke the language, who had the conversation, who explained to them why it was necessary. So a lot of the stuff that we did helped us to get to this point where I believe that, look, we're not gonna get 100% compliance, but for the most part, you know, San Francisco did okay. We can do better always. We can do better always because you still, I still see some things that make me crazy. You have people who are waiting in line and wouldn't put on their mask. And, you know, I walked into one of the grocery stores that I go to one day and I saw all these people in there. They didn't have folks waiting in line. I called Dr. Colfax. I'm like, get a help person over there right now. We need to shut the grocery store down. I walked, I needed stuff, but I walked right out. And so, it was really about trying to get people used to a change that they just weren't used to. And I think that's what's been really helpful. Talk a little bit about, you mentioned disparities. You mentioned you're gonna have an announcement later today. I was hoping you would, you would tell us here, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you if you want. I mean, it's- Sure, well, tell, we only have a few more minutes with you, but talk a little about sort of how, once that became clear that the disparities were real and profound and some of that happened through the work that Dan Havler has done with the city, um, how did you process it and what have you and what has the city done to try to address that? So I think what, you know, what I'm really proud is the city, even with a $1.5 billion budget deficit, we still continue to uh, keep all of our employees. We still uh, made, you know, payments to all of our nonprofits. They were still able to receive their funding, even though some have had to probably close. Uh, and we've seen nonprofits and organizations divert what they traditionally do to help with this crisis, especially to address the disparity. Um, so that happened. There were some additional investments in food security and um, uh, subsidies for, for jobs, uh, people who had to quarantine and didn't have any other way of getting income, you know, being able to isolate at hotels. Like we did all these great things but the disparity specifically with the Latino community didn't change. So like, like we're seeing the majority of the subsidies and the money that we uh, issued, including private philanthropy through give to sf we've seen that mostly go to support the Latino community, but we still see the disparity. And what that means is we have not done enough. And um, we today are announcing a major uh, investment in helping to increase testing significantly, uh, to increase our contact tracing efforts, uh, to provide additional resources for food security and all of these other things we're doing. Uh, and then the education and the outreach components. So, so, so there's definitely more that we need to do. Yes, we see the number of cases continue to decline. We see the hospitalization rates go down. Um, we are over 80% in our contract, contact tracing efforts. But there is still this disparity, which means that we have got to be aggressive and very deliberate about what we should be doing with this particular community in order to change what that disparity is. And so I think this significant investment that we're about to make for specific uh, things that will, will lead to the success that we know we need to really combat uh, this virus, because we know that these are people who are uh, there are a lot of immigrants. There are a lot of people who live in close quarters with other family members. There are essential workers. They're the ones who are working, you know, all over San Francisco because they can't afford not to work. Uh, so we have to do a better job to address that disparity. And I'm really, 
you know, excited about this investment and hopefully we'll notice a difference in the next few weeks. Well, thank you for, uh, for all of that and for uh, all you've done. It really, you have saved many, many lives and we are grateful. We're grateful for the partnership. I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't let you go. So <laughs> thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll leave, all the, leave it all to the doctors now anyway. <laughs> yeah, we'd love, to, love to have you stay. We'll bring you back again. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Let's, Thanks uh, everybody. All right, let's turn to uh, Tomas and Grant. And also let me introduce my colleagues from UCSF to join us. Uh, first is Diane Havlier, uh, Diane's Professor and Chief of the Division of HIV Infectious Disease and Global Medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Uh, she has led the, uh, the comprehensive study partnering with the DPH uh, in the Mission District as well as in Bolinas and a lot of other very important work to help uh, us understand this pandemic better, particularly the issues of disparities. George Rutherford barely needs an introduction in this session. He's Professor in Epidemiology and Biostatistics uh, and he has really become all of our go-to person to make sense of, sense of the numbers and help us figure out where this is going. Uh, Paul Volberding is Emeritus Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Medicine. He's Director of the UCSF, UCSF AIDS Research Institute. Uh, he was the former Director of the MFAR Institute for HIV Cure, former Associate Chair for Global Health in our department, and famously really uh, was the clinical leader I'd say in the world of our response to HIV and AIDS uh, in the early days in the 80s and 90s from the moment when he was a fellow to becoming a faculty member, HIV exploded at that point and Paul really uh, was, was and remains an extraordinary leader in that area. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, let me start with Grant and, and, and Tomas. Um, the mayor just gave you guys a lot of credit for having said what you said to her and said it the right way. Uh, what were you thinking as you were trying to convince her to do something that must have been an extraordinarily hard political act? Maybe Grant, go ahead and get started. Well, thank you, um, Bob, and I really appreciate being here. And I have to say that um, really bringing forward the data, um, really thinking about the fact that uh, in our institutional memory, our response and following up on your comments about Dr. Volberding and so many people here who were, who were involved in the HIV epidemic. I really think our um, aggressive early action, action following the science and data was to do to act early. Um, we we uh, looked at the information and saw where things could potentially be headed. And in looking at what was happening internationally at that time, there wasn't a jurisdiction that said, that, that appeared to have overreacted, right? So I think every, the, the virus was always ahead of the actions that were taken. And actually, um, I, I, we, we, when we met with um, the mayor early on, we actually presented data um, that had been put together in collaboration with UCSF colleagues, um, with Dr. Havlier's team, uh, Dr. Maya Peterson, and looked at the projections about where things could go and how quickly um, the virus could um, get out of control in our city. And as the mayor um, uh, mentioned, we looked at that in relationship to our hospital capacity. And the mayor has always been very data-driven, uh, very focused on uh, uh, ensuring that, that, that uh, she has the information needed and that did not hesitate once we showed her um, to take the actions that, that, that uh, she did and, and drove us to do better in, in that work. But I think it's a collection of also our special relationship with UCSF. Um, you know, when we talk about the various cities and jurisdictions um, across the country, our health department and UCSF have always worked together um, before HIV, certainly during HIV and going forward um, since then. And I think that academic public uh, health partnership has been vital to our ongoing efforts to strengthen this work. And just to give a very pivot, a uh, very, um, Concrete example, I mean, uh, Dr. Havlier, Dr. Rutherford, um, Dr. Eric Goosby, um, and others. I mean, from, from early March on, we've had a, a policy team that meets in the early hours um, once a week to talk about the data to figure out how do we uh, implement and execute and what are the policy implications uh, of, of, of where we need to go next. So that sustained relationship um, has been incredibly important to our response. So I just really wanna thank uh, UCSF for this. And I do think that that has not only slowed the virus, but um, it has really uh, saved saved many lives. Thank you. Tomas, uh, as I understand it, a big part of your role is to, at, at a granular level, to kind of figure out what is allowed and what's not allowed. And so 
we've been talking a fair amount about that early decision to essentially shut everything down. It seemed to me that the harder decisions probably came in May when you had to begin parsing what things can and should be open. And I'm sure those decisions continue to this day. So tell us how you process that. How do you decide when it is time to begin <laughs> loosening up the reins and how then do you decide whether you went too far? So that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think um, the, you know, the, the health officers in the Bay Area, because we've been working together and communicating just about these issues. Um, and because the, the, the Bay Area um, went shelter in place at the same time, and we come to realize that it's easy to shut down. It's hard to open up. And I think we had reached the point where we realized we really, you know, we gave, a, we gave a public health rationale for why you need to shelter in place. But to really open up, it's really about the economy. It's about jobs. It's about this complexity of society that you have all these different stakeholders that we didn't really understand. And so I think one of the things we realized is that we really needed to start working with a broader group of stakeholders. So in San Francisco, um, we developed an economic recovery task force that was led by the assessor's office, uh, Carmen Chu, that brought together representatives, broad representatives of the, uh, of, of the economy from small business, nonprofits, really a large group of people. The, the whole um, task force had over, over 100 people. And it was really getting there, really plugging into their wisdom and then at the state level, we got guidelines as to what, what we could do. And so we would work with what the state would allow us to do because the ultimate, the ultimate authority is at the state level. And then we'd work with our stakeholders to sort of craft how we could move forward doing low risk, lower risk things first before higher risk things and pacing things out so we have enough time to monitor as we open things up. So that was a general strategy. And it, it, as you had those meetings with the, <clears throat> with the business community, was there kind of a, a tension of, well, we've got to open up because of the economy and then the public health people saying, no, we can't because of the virus? Or was everybody, tend, did people tend to be more in sync? Uh, the quick answer is there is always, uh, there is always tension. <laughs> there's always tension. And, there, and there's tensions from actually even within the counties because every, every county is different. We're a city and a county. So it's a little bit easier for us because we're completely integrated at the county level. But you can imagine at the other counties where you have, because the, the public health authority happens at the county level and then you have multiple cities and multiple mayors. And, and, and so you're having this tremendous pressure to move faster and faster and faster. And whatever the state allows you to open, there's pressure to open it right away. San Francisco in general has been more cautious. We're the second densest city in the United States after New York City. So we have these special risks that we really had to take into account. Yeah. Let me turn to the HIV question for a second and Grant brought it up. I maybe turn to Paul and uh, you know George was there. Diane and I were there, we were too young to remember. Um, <laughs> I think we both were about the same vintage. Paul, when you heard about COVID, um, how did that, how did you process that having lived through HIV? Did it feel like this is going to be kind of, I've seen this movie before, or were there kind of fundamental differences in, in the way you thought this would play out versus, versus AIDS? Sure. Thanks, Bob. Um, I, I would have to say I, I, it did bring back, you know, seeing an epidemic unfold um, again. Um, so there were de definitely um, kind of echoes of, of our experience, all, all of ours with, with the HIV epidemic. It was clear uh, right from the start, I think, that there were real differences. I mean, HIV, fortunately, was not very transmissible. This thing really is, everyone is at risk. So um, I think there were there were huge differences, but the, but the way the city, the university and the DPH have responded is that that's what um, brings that back to me because it, everything that Grant said, you know, was true back in back in those days. And, and I think Grant made the point that one of the things we learned from HIV was was you got to react fast. And if you're going to blow it, you, it's from underreacting. Is that a lesson that you took? And were there other lessons from HIV that you think were particularly useful for COVID? Uh, you know, I, 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 during the early epidemic, HIV epidemic, it, it felt like things were going very fast. You know, we'd have new discoveries, new papers coming out. But in retrospect, compared to what we have now, it was glacially slow. Yeah. Uh, so I think the stakes were spread out a little bit more over time um, so we could try things. 
Um, probably the biggest issue that I'm, I'm reminded of um, is the, the, the bathhouse issue where, you know, there were good meaning people on different sides, just as there are, I'm, I'm sure, with the issue of schools opening and, and, and public health, um, that, you know, there was a lot of tension. Um, but I think we made the right decisions at the time. Can you just give a 15 minute, uh, 15, not 15, 15 second <laughs> snapshot of the bathhouse issue? I'm I probably could I'm give it. that there are a fair number of people who do not know what the bathhouse is. Oh, okay, okay. I, I guess I could give a 15 minute version. No, no, no. I'm sure you uh, So uh, bathhouses, commercial establishments, um, the, and, and the, the, the Board of Supervisors just last week agreed that they could reopen again. Of course, they can't because of COVID. Uh, but they closed down in 1984. There were places where people had anonymous sex largely. Um, there are clearly places where, uh, where any STI uh, is transmitted, including HIV. And so the decision was, although there were big civil rights issues and very sensitive ones, the, 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 and there was a battle between Feinstein and Silverman, the health department, um, the decision was made that they really needed to be closed. And I think that was a, the correct decision. Right. Uh, actually, before I turn to George, I, I, I see we're going to lose Grant in a few minutes. So I want to throw one more question in Grant's direction before we uh, get George's reaction to, to the HIV issue. Uh, Grant, in May or maybe early June, we started to see something of a surge. And I remember you made some pronouncements that were pretty dire, um, you know, sort of scary and, and made me wonder, are you seeing data that we're not seeing or is this your way of shaking people and saying, folks, if we don't get our acts together, you know, we could be New York City, you know, it's sort of the general question is how do you process sort of in some ways worst case scenario and taking advantage of fear in a way while also being straightforward and, and uh, it's, a, it's a tough balance. So how did, how did you think that through in June when we started seeing an uptick in the numbers? Well, I think it's it's that exactly that tension around making sure that people understand what the possibilities are, given what the data are showing, uh, versus uh, uh, working against prevention fatigue, right? And I think that's that's where where we we are could be headed um, uh, unless we continue to focus on on the the risk and taking the proper precautions. We crushed the curve. Um, in March and April, um, cases to, after peaking at nearly 100 declined to uh, uh, about 25 people in the hospital. I'm talking about cases, I'm talking about hospitalized cases because that's really how we monitor um, the severity of, of, the, of the epidemic with regard to the, the healthcare system ability to respond. And then we saw that uptick. Um, and that uptick really followed after some, uh, it, some uh, days of increased activity, civic activity and others, for instance, Memorial Day, um, we saw a pretty tight correlation with an uptick in cases and hospitalizations. And of course, hospitalizations usually lag about two weeks um, after we start seeing cases uh, increase. Right now, we've been in a relatively um, uh, steady state. We're still pretty high. We're higher than our nadir um, of, of the late spring. We're um, between uh, about 55 and 75 cases for, for um, the last uh, three to four weeks. Um, so we're watching that very carefully. So when you ask about how we decide that there's you know, potentially a surge coming in and say how bad it can get, that is really looking at the modeling. And I think the real challenge with this virus is that it, it increases logarithmically. So it basically the curve is so steep that once it gets out of control, it's very hard to put it back uh, under control. And that's what we saw happen in New York, right? So the, the curve was so high that basically there were thousands and thousands of cases and the hospital systems got overwhelmed, which was one of the key reasons we had such a high mortality rate. So we're always looking at that, that slope. It's not so much the only the numbers of people in the hospital, it's how quickly that number is going up. And we, when we start to see that increase, uh, we try to get um, ahead of it. We have to get ahead of it. And that's when we send out the messages about there is a surge um, and, and we need to be very careful and, 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 and cautious. And that's why um, in, in the late summer, we started to put a pause on some of the reopening. You know, we're watching this, we're reopening a lot right now. The masking piece is so important. I mean, we've learned a lot since the early spring about how to uh, prevent this virus's spread. I think it's important to emphasize that. 
mask, and this has been emphasized um, uh, nationally by, by, by scientists who are speaking to the data science of facts. Masks right now are incredibly effective. If we get to an 80% or higher masking uh, in our communities, that will be, have a major impact on slowing the virus. Social distancing, of course. But as we go into the winter, if we look at the history of other flu pandemics, um, including in 1918, the biggest increase came uh, in, in, in the late fall and early winter. So we're watching that very carefully. And I think we just have to continue to um, focus on the prevention and public health messages and ensure that key community stakeholders and community leaders and communities most affected by uh, the virus that, that, that we are supporting, uh, listening and sharing those messages so that um, communities most at risk hear, 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 hear the message and have the tools they need to prevent the virus's spread. We're in a volatile time um, and our message is gonna continue to be um, take, use the mask, do the social distancing, take the precautions. And we also know if people take those precautions, we now have two major data points in San Francisco. Prevention works. We had a surge, we decreased the, the curve. We had a second surge that started in July that could have gotten us into a New York scenario again. People took action, we saw a decrease again. So, you know, it, it's, it sometimes feels hard to find good news in this, in this pandemic, but we know that the, the virus is very sensitive to actions of society and we actually know how to slow the spread now. Great, I think I need to let you go. So uh, thank you for everything you've done and we're proud of you and uh, we really appreciate your partnership in this and keep up the great work. You're keeping all of us safe. Well, thank uh, you so much. Thanks, Grant. Bye -bye. Um, all right, let me turn back to George and, and, and George, what are your lessons from HIV? What's the same, what's different? What did we learn from it? You're on mute. I think Paul hit, hit the nail on the head and, and, and hit the highlights. I think you have to realize how good the health department is. Um, and that has a really long tradition. And I came in 1985 and um, when Merv Silverman was still the health officer. Um, and it was, it, it was, you know, it was, did, you know, there were people who were publishing articles in the New England Journal and having editorials about them that had nothing to do with HIV. And I think HIV really kind of propelled it. Um, and the people in the AIDS office at that, that point in time that I was the director of include people like Sandra Hernandez, uh, Mitch Katz, uh, George Lemp, who went on to lead the st statewide uh, task force for University of California. Alan Lifson is a professor at uh, uh, University of Michigan, uh, University of Minnesota. Susan Buckbinder, who's still there, is a PI of the vaccine trials. I mean, there are a lot of you know people who are very accomplished who came through the health department and I think really put it on the map. I think now looking on it, looking at it from the other side, you know, I think the universities contributed uh, a lot, and we've done it. I hope in a in a way that's not overbearing and is has been helpful. But uh, just for the contact tracing uh, alone, you know, the group that we put on the ground to help the uh, to help Tomas and and his colleagues has traced, you know, like eight thousand people, and is there two hundred trained two hundred and fifty contact tracers for San Francisco alone. You've gone and started to train people around the state, and so it's it's a really nice relationship with the uh, uh, with the city health department. And one when I was on the other side of it at the city health department, that I um, you know I felt it on a daily basis that they were really collegial, um, and uh, people like Paul and and Connie Wafsi and and Don Don Abrams pick up the phone and talk to him anytime you wanted to. Jay Levy too, I mean for that matter. But it was it was a very collegial atmosphere, and I think that's really kind of the same thing that we've managed to carry forward. Great. Dan, I think in your study may be one of the more tangible manifestations of the partnership. You want to tell us a little bit about where it is and also its genesis in terms of the relationship between UCSF and, and the city. Um, thanks, Bob. So, I mean, I think one of the things we know, just to make the point hasn't been brought up as much, is one of the things we learned in the AIDS epidemic is that this trifecta of the public health department leadership academic centers and the community all working together, that is the magical formula to respond to any pandemic. And we've learned that in HIV. And I think it's also important to say, we're talking about all things that are rosy. Like one of the things about San Francisco, it is a strength when everybody doesn't agree all the time. But what you need to do is to have people with differing opinions, have the evidence, have the science. As Tomas says, some of these really tough questions come up, bring everybody together 
and ultimately make sure everyone has a voice that's heard and use this to move forward. And I really want to compliment everyone at UCSF and the health department really for um, doing that. But one thing to say is one of the reasons that we've been successful in HIV is we don't pat ourselves on the back too much and we keep on saying this is not good enough. And that's the segue to when we look at our hospital, certainly in San Francisco General, where early on over 80% of the patients that were hospitalized were Latinx, when it's usually around 20 to 30%, that was a signal that this is a real disparity. So um, that is how um, that our research um, group wanted to partner with um, the community and Latino task force, which we've been on Grand Rounds previously, how fabulous they are, and the health department. And also to say, you know, for all the junior people out there, um, this, the other thing when a new pandemic comes around, you have no idea how much you're learning. Everything you do, you are the experts of this disease and you are gonna be taking this for the next pandemic and you're gonna be, we're gonna have role reversal here. And I think that's really, really important to acknowledge. So when we saw this disparity, what our group has been trying to do is a couple of things is to, um, first of all, um, under really, and the topical sentence is understand about what's happening in community transmission, really in um, our neighborhood right by the hospital, the Mission District, and what it means for the broader San Francisco. And, you know, what we've learned, um, you know, early on was that um, the reason why the transmission was being enabled by people essentially who can't work at home, it kind of makes sense. Looks like the virus came in for people who could work at home, okay? Then they started working at home. The people that kept our city going that was running our restaurants, doing all this, they were getting infected and then they could stay at home. They were frontline workers and they were living in conditions that were super crowded. And so this just um, uh, amplified the transmission of this um, particular virus. And the inequities that are just not specific to this pandemic, um, it's like if one just, you know, when we last, so when we first did six weeks into shelter in our place, we were alarmed to see that 2% of people walking around were PCR positive, but we were more alarmed when, you know, a little bit near the peak of what Grant talked about, 9% of people were PCR positive walking around. This is when we just put up tents at Mission in uh, 24th and said, if you want to get tested, get tested. So, I mean, it's, and I think UCSF has a true mission to work with communities to understand more um, about disparities, but really the common themes are that people don't have health benefits of the people who were PCR positive, only 22% of those people had health benefits. So, you know, in order, in order, in other words, they could get paid if they took time off. So I think one of the things our group is trying to do is to understand expose for actionable um, steps that we can take to reduce these disparities, to share our data real time with the community, with the health department, to get new um, strategies for us to really to reduce the number of total cases, reduce the suffering. And it's not just deaths, you know, a couple of weeks in the ICU, all the doctors on the call know this, for patients is, is really bad. And the, the effect on the households that people have someone in the intensive care unit is not insignificant um, to see if we can move forward and be a model as we have been in HIV for other cities to respond to COVID at the same time being humble about what we've accomplished. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Tomas, I think we only have you for a few more minutes and then we'll keep going until I think 115 with the rest of my UCSF colleagues. Only a couple of questions for you. How has the uh, federal response, which we haven't mentioned so far, but to be charitable has, has not been great. How has that influenced your work? Did, did we have to do more and different things than we would have if the CDC was acting as it normally would have? Yeah, that, that, that's a, it's an incredible question. I, obviously, I actually, the, the statistic that you mentioned earlier on, if other parts of the country had the same um, statistics that San Francisco have, how many lives would have been saved? And I think th that statistic that you basically said really says it all. What happens when you don't have government that really government is, is, the, only, is the only entity that has the ability to really coordinate all of this activity across the whole sector, all the different sectors. And so I mean, we noticed we noticed it early. We noticed it early on with all the issues around testing and the frustrations. And one of the one of the sad things for me is that 
you know, there, there was a time early on where we really paid attention to being on the CDC calls. And unfortunately, most of that has gone away. We really end up depending on the local calls, the state calls. It's really been a regional, it's really been a really regional approach and not depending on, on the CDC. And, and then whenever they come out with guidance, we read everything carefully, of course. And you see, you see what happens with the whole issue around aerosolization and testing of people who are, who are close contacts but asymptomatic. So yeah, it's it's been it's been frustrating. Fortunately, we're in California, and we we have we have support all the way up through the governor in terms of the type of approach we take. And and how has the relationship with the state uh, influenced the approach here? Yeah, so I you know this is because I've been in, in doing communicable disease control for such a long time. I can just tell you, it for us it's always been really good. Communicable disease is one of these things one of these entities that up and down, up and down levels of government, we work really well together in public health because communicable disease don't respect boundaries. So you're always coordinating with other counties, you're always coordinating with the state. And so we have really decades of experience working really closely with the state health department. So for me, it's been, it's been very positive. Right. Uh, one of the questions that came in was, um, do you think, or have you considered punitive actions for people that don't follow the guidelines. The mayor mentioned that she saw guidelines being violated and that led to a call, I guess probably to you, <laughs> to figure out what to do with that business. But but there are other places around the world that are actually, uh, there are punitive actions that people take if they, as individuals, are not wearing masks, for example. How do, how do you decide on that kind of thing? Yeah, I, you know, there's a couple of ways. One is we've implemented a lot of big restrictions. I mean, if you think of what we've done, shutting down the economy, um, so, you know, schools being closed. So there are a lot of things that are that have already been done that have been punitive. And so, and people are very stressed out. People don't need another thing that's, that's punitive. And so we have really focused on support, education, and really, and then moving towards compliance, helping to nudge people to do things in a positive way, giving them the facts, the information. You're trying to get a population health effect. You're not going to get 100% adherence ever. So you're trying to get an average effect to actually make a public health difference. And if you do it in a positive way, it doesn't add additional additional to stress to staff. So that's been that's been our, our general approach. Occasionally, as we we do have a whole compliance plan that will be implemented over the next several weeks that is going to focus primarily on businesses, areas where where employers are not complying with what we now know is common sense and doing a better job of protecting their workers. And so we are, we are going to be moving in that direction. And you may see, you may see, you may see things become a little bit more restrictive in that, in that way. Uh, maybe last question for you, and then I'll turn to my colleagues. Sure. Uh, the schools seem like maybe the hardest question of all. In some ways, it's, it doesn't feel like it pits public health against the economy. It almost pits public health against public health. So how have you managed, have you grappled with the school question? And so you thank you, thank you for bringing up schools because yeah, for sure. me, <laughs> <laughs> After school, everybody's gone. <laughs> well, the, well, I mean, the thing is, is that the, unfortunately in our society, oftentimes children are the last that we focus on. And for me, um, the schools has really become my true north because in order to open up schools, you have to get community transmission down and to get community transmission down, you have to deal with the essential workforce. And focusing on schools is our opportunity to really have a, a large equity impact. And so if we, can, if we can open up schools safely and keep kids in school safely, we will really be helping those communities that are low income, where the communities, the families really depend on that education. For, you depend on for a lot of things. And so the way that we really have been framing it is, and so that everyone's really mobilized around schools, we're actually, we're actually going and doing site visits for every single school. And so that's really impressive. And I, as far as I'm aware that we're the, we're, we may be the only location that's actually doing that, not just requiring a plan that's approved, but also doing site visits. And for us, it's really been a, a racial equity challenge. Everybody realizes this is our opportunity to really, in a very concrete way, do something that's anti-racist, which is getting the kids in school and keeping them in school. And so that's, everyone's very motivated in the city. And so I'm really excited about the commitment from the mayor, the mayor, board of supervisors, everybody's on board. Great. I know you have to go. So let me let you go. Thank you for, uh, for joining us again. Thank you for all your work in this. I know some of very, very hard choices, but they have absolutely saved lives and we appreciate it and appreciate the partnership. And so uh, thank you. Let me, let me turn back to our colleagues. Um, so 
George, what are you what are you seeing now for the fall and um, you know where things are going? Uh, no slides, just <laughs> just and 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 particularly in San Francisco, you know we. As I said, Grant came out with some really scary projections in in June and July. We turned the ship around pretty quickly. Do you think that will be San Francisco's story for the next year? That we're maybe a little surge and then we turn it around when when he he scolds us, or do you think there's a danger that we may let things get out of control? Well, there's a huge danger that things will get out of control, and in fact, they're already out of control in much of the country. Uh, it looks like there's a third wave that's already starting in the Midwest and the, and the East. Uh, we don't see that here. And hopefully with, you know, as Tomas says, if we can get to 80% mass compliance, we won't see it here. But um, I mean, the other thing is leaving aside our own institution, there's not a big college here in, in San Francisco. I mean, sure, USF, um, but it's not, um, but you know, it's not like having Cal or, 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 or Stanford or USC or UCLA. You know, where the great or the state colleges, the great big campuses with all sorts of people coming back. I think that's going to be the engine that plus high schools, plus maybe middle schools. Um, and so that's why it's so that's why the schools are so exquisitely important um, in order to keep the, you know, keep the uh, keep transmission low among 12 to 22 year olds. Now, the state college has taken it straight off the map because they're not, you know, they're really not going to come back at all. Um, but, you know, as other colleges open up. You know, I think we're going to, you know, we could, we're going to see surges. Um, the question is, will they, can they, will they remain in the East Bay or, or the South Bay? Um, you know, and what's going to go on with the high schools? Um, and it's going to be, you know, it's potentially big problems. Uh, but I think that we're probably going to see modest increases here. Uh, and I think we're going to be able to, given the uh, mass compliance, uh, and I think we'll be okay, although it's something to really bear very close watching because it could go south quickly. Uh, Diane, one of the most striking pieces of data that I think I first saw from George was the extraordinarily low case mortality rate in San Francisco. And uh, it's sort of easy to explain, easier to explain low case rates and people are, the, 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 the guidance we've gotten from, from, uh, from the city has been wise and people have been mostly doing the right thing. But to see that kind of differences in mortality rates, you know, we're good, but I'm not sure we're that much better in taking care of sick people than they are in New York or in Boston or other cities. So how, how are you processing that a mortality rate per case that seems like it's a fraction of, of many other cities? Um, well, thanks, Bob. I think everybody has an opinion about this and I'm gonna give you my opinion where I would say that I think one of the drivers of this is we have extraordinary care in San Francisco and particularly at UCSF an intensive care unit. I mean, remember so much, just like the virus moves very fast, the knowledge that has been learned um, in caring for these patients was extremely rapidly. And you know, we have now randomized trials that influence mortality for the sickest patients and I think that that really has made a difference. Steroids, proning, remdesivir. We had the um, advantage of with our um, surges being a little bit later that we could um, incorporate those um, uh, uh, into, uh, into our, our care. So I, my, this is my own opinion. I think that that has been one of the um, predominant um, uh, drivers of our lower mortality. Now, of course, you can look at age, who's affected age-wise. That's certainly one of them. One thing that the, uh, uh, the public health department, I see Tomas, if he's still on the call, we were in the situation, you know, when you look at mortality rates in the United States, there's a huge proportion that were a result of mismanagement of nursing homes. We have a very large nursing home, Laguna Honda in San Francisco. It's you know, like a cruise ship on land in terms of the possibility for there to be transmission. Um, you know, early on, uh, there was transmission that was detected at Laguna Honda and our health department jumped right on it. And you know, that's not per case mortality, but that could have really made our numbers, absolute numbers go up. And I think really want to do a shout out to the health department for their response to that setting. 
Yeah, I, I think not a single person died at Lagoon Honda, as I understand it, either either patients or <coughs> or uh, providers, which is remarkable when we saw the early surge. George, what's your theory about the mortality rate? I think Diane's. I think Diane's right. I mean, what, one thing is we didn't contributing to that is that we had the luxury of not being utterly overwhelmed, like New York with patients in the hallways on blowers and. You know all that. You know all that kind of mess that you saw in Italy and Spain and 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 New York. Now, why did that happen? You know, it's because New York got more cases to start with from Europe, uh, whereas we had fewer from China. Um, I think it's you know I think that has a lot to do with it. But you know, on the other hand, we got on them quickly. We more quickly. We had shelter in place in place substantially earlier, and I think we did. You know, I think we did a much better job of keeping the overall morbidity down, the overall disease transmission rate down which translated to fewer hospitalized patients and fewer ICU patients um, so that we could, could do a better job uh, taking care of them and giving them the, you know, sort of the benefit, you know, the real benefit of advanced knowledge and, and um, true intensive care. Yeah, I mean, it's my sense as well. If you remember on this, in this conference, uh, after our colleagues got back from New York and they described the situation there with, you know, one nurse taking care of seven or eight ICU patients on vents, Whereas here, yeah. it's one to one, you can imagine how that would make a massive difference. That yeah. seems a plausible, a substantial part of the explanation. Uh, Paul, uh, sort of reflecting back on the politics of of, of AIDS and the politics of this, uh, you know, you'll recall that the president of the country, uh, Ronald Reagan, did not utter the word AIDS in a speech until 1987, six years after the first cases. And that always felt like it was because there was a, once it became clear that it was a specific population that was disenfranchised, it changed the politics. Here, you might've expected differently in that everybody, everybody's at risk of this thing. So how surprised have you been by the political response at the national level? Uh, you know, and, and we have to keep the language clean here, but <laughs> just reflect a little bit on the politics of AIDS, because you were right in the middle of it. I mean, you were, activists were taking you on and, and you were dealing with the federal government and all that. So I'm sure you've thought about this a lot. I've thought about it a lot. I, I, you know, I, I, I probably don't have 15 minutes again, do I? No, 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 15, <laughs> you have more than 15 seconds. <laughs> the, uh, um, Sure. I mean, any, I think any of these big epidemics end up being very political. I mean, it's just the nature of, of the beast. Um, and both that one and this one are in, in different ways. I think the, what we, the benefit that we had was that throughout the AIDS epidemic, the CDC remained a really pure center uh, for information and really unbiased. So no matter what Reagan was or wasn't saying, um, and mostly, I think he's remembered for not saying anything about AIDS, uh, but there were things happening. The grants were being funded, um, so even, even without him. Uh, but the current situation is just kind of hard to imagine. Um, I want to come back just really quickly to one thing that Diane said that I think is super important. That is that um, here, the connection, Diane, that you've made with, in, the, in the, the Latinx community has been really important. Too bad that medical establishment maybe didn't have as good a connection with that community before this epidemic as we as we should have, and the same was really true in the, in the AIDS epidemic. We had almost no connection between the medical community and the gay community um, when before before AIDS. We should have, but didn't. But I think the the importance of community engagement and community communications is is super important. It'll be important for the next epidemic. It was interesting, though, if you think about in AIDS, the connection was partly forced on not just the medical establishment, but all establishments by the community itself, which proved to be uniquely capable of activism. Uh, you know, at, at not just I mean, we, we, we were we were all targets of it in various times and uh, uh, they were extraordinarily good at it, not only in sort of the, the act of activism, but, it, but in becoming experts in the disease, uh, in the science of it. Um, what, what are the lessons from that are, you know, do, do, I mean, you sort of hate to ask these communities that are already disenfranchised to have to advocate for themselves, but it did seem like part of what began to turn the tide in HIV was the gay community advocating for themselves in part because they felt like nobody else would. 
Absolutely. And I think the, the, the fault there is not in the activist fault was in the medical um, and political community. The fact that we had allowed the, the gap in the communications, uh, you know, the, the gap in understanding of the community to be so broad that it, that it was, that they felt appropriately so that they weren't being heard. Um, maybe, maybe we've doing a better job of that uh, with this, uh, with this epidemic. Um, so I think, I think going forward, there's, that's going to be one of the really, to me, really, really one of the important lessons is how do we do a better job of that? How do we really seriously think about community engagement in ways that we didn't appropriately um, in, in the AIDS epidemic? Is that a lesson that you learned, Diane, in terms of sort of the importance of, of not just working with community, but the act, you know, the community as potentially being able to move the needle on resources in ways that the, that the scientific establishment can't do? Oh, 100%. I mean, it, you cannot respond to an epidemic without the community, the science, and the political leaders. And I know that, I think it was last week that the mayor held a meeting with the, um, all the Latino groups in the city and just listened to them. And those are the kind of things that have to happen. Our job is, you know, doctors and scientists provide the best care, generate evidence, share it, share it with our community members so they can do their advocacy. And that is the most effective approach. And we learned that from HIV. So we only have a few minutes left. I, you know, we've talked about vaccines here. We've talked about testing, but today's topic is San Francisco and what San Francisco did right and lessons learned. How, maybe I'll turn to George first. How do you see the testing thing and the vaccine thing as they apply to San Francisco? So what do you, what do you think things will be like in three to six months in both of those areas. Uh, you may have to talk about what you think they'll be like generally, but it, will there be something about how San Francisco deals in, with both of those crucial areas that, that's distinctive? San Francisco right now tests more than any county in California on a per capita basis. And I think you're going to see, continue to see that, that grow. Uh, interestingly, um, some of the large health systems in the city haven't done, uh, I'm, this is what, uh, if, if Grant were here, this is what he'd say, They've uh, not done their fair share of testing, um, and that's one of the things that needs to be needs to be fixed. Um, that you really can get essentially testing on demand um, throughout the city, whatever whatever your coverage insurance coverage is. So that's one thing that's going to see ramp ramp up. I think we're going to continue to see an increase in testing. Right now, uh, we're testing about 3,500, 4,000 people a day, and I think that may may well double uh, by the time we get out to. Um, to the spring, and are we moving forward with the with the the faster uh, faster tests? Yeah, and less knock just tests as well. Uh, I don't know if you saw the the uh, we had a picture that was circulating the other day about how exactly to do a nasal pharyngeal swab, and it, you know, it sort of makes you ill to look at it. But um, it's it you know to, to move to less noxious methods and and rapid more rapid turnaround and less expensive things like antigen testing, where it really is about a cadence of testing and not just one time testing. In terms of vaccines, vaccines are going to be very complicated. Um, you know that the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines both require minus 70 degree centigrade freezers. Um, and uh, so that's not the world's simplest uh, thing to, to, to put together. Um, there's going to be a lot of demand for vaccines early on. The federal government's going to be controlling the supply. So you can bet that the, um, you know, the military is going to get, in, get immunized first, I would bet. Um, before even, you know, before even uh, ICU uh, staffs. But, you know, if you say there's a million doses, that's enough for 500,000 people because they're all two doses, except maybe the new J&J &J vaccine. Um, you know, 500,000 doses nationally and California has 15% of the population. That's enough for 75,000 people. So who are the 75,000 people who are going to get it? That's what the real touchy stuff is going to be about who exactly is on the list and who is exactly not on the list until we can really get production way up. And I think what will probably happen is we'll have three or four licensed vaccines and people can, and we may actually be able to, to cross, um, to, to start with one and use another one that remains to be seen, but we can see how that, how it eventually plays out, but it's gonna take a while to get to a point where we can vaccinate everybody that we would like to vaccinate, which is 100%, or which we'll end up vaccinating, which is probably something less than that. Yeah. Diane, any any comments on how you think these are those two issues are going to play out here? 
I think, I think that just to add to, to vaccine, we have, we're gonna to have to deal with vaccine hesitancy. Uh, some of the most affected populations um, are suspicious and not willing to take a vaccine and conspiracy theories are wild in some of the most affected populations. I think for testing, one thing we have to get better at, we need to remember it's not just about get, getting the testing, it's about getting it fast and responding. And so when we just did our last study that we, if you just take a person who's symptomatic, on average, we recommend 10 days of isolation if we only, on average, we only had like four or five days left, we're not getting the maximum benefit from that. So we have to work on the distal end of the test and respond cascade. Great. Paul, I'll leave you with the last word. Anything, either comment on that or any final observations of your life in, in AIDS and HIV that, uh, that you'd like to share with us? No, I mean, uh, so I was thinking this morning that, you know, when I saw my first patients when we did in, in 1981, um, the polio epidemic was about 40 years earlier. Um, and now the HIV epidemic is 40 years earlier than this one. I think none of us thought at all about polio or really knew anything about it. I think that we, we forget too soon um, because the lessons that, we, that we've learned from each of these epidemics are, are really remarkably similar, I think. Uh, and and I, would, I would end with, again, just saying that the remarkable uh, relationship that we had here uh, with the health department, uh, which is instinctively academic, with the with the university, which likes to work with the health department, and political leaders and community leaders, uh, really was the uh, was key to our uh, successes in in the last epidemic, and and as we've heard today, um, absolutely key to uh, to this one as well. So it makes me proud to be in in this city. Well, it's a good note to end on, and I agree. I think the response has been remarkable and was remarkable. Those of us who came to San Francisco at a time where HIV was just beginning to take off, uh, it was astounding to see how well the city responded to that challenge. And uh, it is part of what makes me proud to be here and proud to be in the city. And let's hope we can keep it up. It's obviously, you know, we got another year or so of this probably. So uh, the issues of fatigue are going to be very, very real, but uh, at least so far, so far, pretty good. All right. With that, let us uh, quit. Thank you all uh, for being part of this. Uh, really appreciate it. Let me thank my production team, who you see listed here, who bring these things up uh, each week flawlessly, which is uh, not easy to do. As I said, next week, we'll do a non-COVID topic in Grand Round. So uh, those of you who are just following for COVID, uh, uh, come back again in two weeks on October 8th, where we'll cover whatever is uh, seems new and important at the time. Until then, stay safe, and thanks again for joining us.